then it cut its dividend. Uh, it did lay out some future board changes. The stock fell this morning down another 2%. We are now joined by GE's chairman and CEO, John Flannery, right here at the exchange. Also nice to see that you got the, the, uh, the dress memo. Very well done yeah, there, uh, John. Um, and nice to have you. Thank you, uh, nice particularly after yesterday. Listen, the stock is down yet again today. Um, uh, you know, I termed it earlier, uh, having spoken to some of your investors, as saying they're unsettled, that yesterday they didn't feel as though they got the complete picture or the real sense that the plan is in place. How do you respond to that, hearing that 24 hours after you began your presentation? Listen, I think we we're very clear about where we're headed as a company. So we laid that out yesterday. We're going to focus on three businesses going forward. There's a lot of other portfolio things we have to do outside of those things, and we discussed Baker Hughes and other assets. So it's quite clear we've got strong franchises at the core of this company. Uh, the power business needs fixing. We laid a lot of detail out about that yesterday. Healthcare strong, aviation strong. So the direction of the company is clear. We disappointed people with some tough news yesterday. So we were low on 18 uh, outlook. We were low, obviously, dividend cut, and I think lower than most people expected. So I'm not surprised the investor reaction because we had uh, disappointing news. But I'm very confident where we're headed with the company and what we need to do, and the team is ready to go. Yeah, I mean, it was only two years ago that people were anticipating as much as $2 a share in right. earnings for 2018. Now you're talking about a number that's roughly half of that. Right. Um, what gives you the confidence, you've, you've mentioned that a number of times in our previous interview as well, yep. that, you, that you are on that right track you just described? A couple of things. I've spent, you know, as we said, 100 days just exhaustively crawling through the company. We've looked at every single business. We've looked at how the company works horizontally, our corporate spending, our research spending. So I have a very strong command of what's going on inside the company. Beyond that, I look at my track record, David. If you go back and look, this is very, very similar to what I experienced in healthcare. I walked in, I had a look and said, this is fundamentally a very good business. And there's some basic things around operating rigor and capital allocation and how we work as a team that make a difference. So I'm feeling very much the same way again. And But I recognize that it's, as I said yesterday, it's show me time. I, I can say what I can say, but the reality is investors deserve and expect and will wait for results. And when it comes to power in particular, which you pointed a, a yeah. spotlight on, I think, again, speaking to people after yesterday, they knew power was in trouble but or had some troubles, but I think they were perhaps a little more alarmed by just how weak things are and how long it may take to get it back on track. So I think the, uh, you know, Russell Stokes, a new leader there, we've changed the leadership in power substantially at every level of the company, at the senior level, inside the services business. There's a new team in there. It is a heavy lift. That's a challenging macro environment right now. But we have a really strong franchise. I keep coming back to that. We uh, generate 30% of the world's electricity. We've got leading technology. We have to manage that asset and uh, run that asset better. So the position of the company, the technology is not the issue. The industry is challenging, but we really exacerbated that with the our performance, and so I'm focused on our performance going forward. All right, John, thank you for coming on. It means a lot to us, it means a lot to our viewers. Uh, we are all trying to figure out how we could have been so wrong about how the company was doing. In February, when the stock was at 30, we did believe that $1.60 for next year was reasonable. That's down from two. We did believe that uh, power was very strong. Okay. We did believe that there were very big synergies in power. We did believe that it was a demonstration of your earnings power that you could give back $30 billion. In retrospect, what happened at the board level, say, where they do uh, decide about capital allocation dividend, that people could have been so wrong about how you were really doing? Well, let, me, let me deconstruct the uh, 2017 sure. number first, the $1.60 number you said. So, we're down around $1.05, $1.10 from $1.60. 15 to 20 cents of that really is a uh, decline in the power in oil and gas segments that I would say uh, was not foreseen at the time points that you referenced. We've got about uh, another 20 to 25 cents change in our restructuring. We've taken a lot of cost actions right. in the company this year that were not contemplated then. Uh, I'm moving very aggressively on that. We've got restructuring charges that weren't anticipated, and we had a write-down of our, our power conversion business. So there's some uh, charges there. And then a little bit around tax and some things about share buyback. So the bulk of this is a power and oil and gas issue, weekend markets, and then some other things that we've taken since then. So there's, there's with respect to the discussion, we constantly are going back and forth about the, the businesses and how they're doing. And 
that was, I'd say, not foreseen some of the things that have happened here. So we have not managed the power business as well as we should have. That is totally on us, and we'll do that going forward. What will you do in terms of restoring the company's credibility? Now, you're shrinking the board, so obviously the board was too yes. big, adding three board members whose names we don't know. We don't know who's going to stay and who's going to go. I understand what you said about health care, but I think health care had very honest accounting. I'm not saying the other accounting was dishonest. I'm saying it was opaque. So what do you tell the board about what the company's really going to earn? And what does the board tell you? Or do you need to replace many members of the board who really either got had, and that's okay, because sometimes we just get had, or simply believed far too much and may still believe and don't belong on the board of an esteemed company that really represents everything that is good about America? So, first, I'd say uh, there's no accounting issue. Second is no one's been had, so I just take issue with those comments right out of the gate. Well, I've been had. I, I, February, in February of, not, of, of this year, Jeff Immel came on my show, and I got Jim, totally listen, I'm, I'm really focused on the company going forward. Well, you asked questions you with... John, with, I absolutely believe that, and I'm sorry to interrupt, and that's rude. Yeah. But I, I think that the notion that we weren't had with the stock at 30 and the stock at 17 just kind of says what I'm, I most fear, which is that it's okay. I would have preferred you to say, Jim, you know what? We didn't get the straight story, and the straight story is bad because that's that's honor. Jim, I've been completely transparent in the time I've been in the job of what the issues are with the company and what I'm doing to fix them. That is my perspective. That's where I am right now. That's how I'm going forward. That's what you would expect of me. And I think we've been quite clear about where we have underperformed and how we fix that. So going back to the past is, is not productive for me. I'm focused on going forward. Yeah. And you would expect that right now. John, you mentioned the 100 days you've been at work on this. Yeah. Um, can you describe how close you came to considering a more aggressive breakup of the portfolio? Because some of the commentary this morning says we've waited this long and it, it wasn't as aggressive as I guess some people hoped. How, how close did you get to that? So I come back, listen, I have looked at, will look at, always will look at every scenario uh, from an analytical, market-backed, quantitative way. So I've looked at all the scenarios and I will continue to do that. Second thing, it's a, a big thing that keeps getting lost in this whole um, context here is the strength of the franchises. We have an issue in our power business. We have some softness in the oil and gas market. The broad contours of the business have strength, and we shouldn't discard those uh, lightly. So as I look at this, I keep coming back to run the businesses better, improve the performance. That's the first port of call. There are people who wanted us to get out of aviation in 2003. There are people who wanted us to get out of healthcare in 2014. We've dramatically improved the healthcare business on uh, growth, on margins, on cash. We still have every strategic option available in that business that we had three years ago when people wanted to uh, dispose of it. So I, I, my task really is to run the assets better, keep an open mind to the alternatives, and that's really what we're doing. I think there's a there's a rush in a uh, to just say let's just. Uh, discard everything. And the reality is these incredible franchises built up over decades, and I think we should be thoughtful and deliberate about managing better and what we do with them going forward. So it's more that than tactical obstacles like lack of buyers or tax implications? No, it's about the businesses themselves and what makes sense and what form we own them and what their achievable uh, you know, output can be, and that's the first call. John, the, uh, the board itself, uh, we've mentioned, of course, going uh, from 18 to 12. Right. Um, when are you going to make the decisions about who is off and who is on? So the 18 to 12 is part of the uh, slate for the a uh, April shareholders meeting. And we'll be doing that uh, between now and the filing of the proxy statement. or going through the GE, uh, the governance process of the board on both who will exit and who the new directors will be. It'll be a, a, our standard governance process, and we'll do that on a deliberate basis. And as well, Mr. Brennan perhaps no longer going to be the lead director? Is that a possibility? No, that's not a possibility. It's not. He it's will not remain. a possibility, yes. Jack is a, uh, a tremendous track record, a tremendous leader. He's been incredibly uh, supportive with me, and I don't see any change there. Um, Baker Hughes, 
you've mentioned yes. that you do intend to potentially sell down what is a roughly 63% stake. We're looking stake. at that now, yes. Well, you, you've got some restrictions on that. I'd just like to get a little bit more specifics in terms of what your expectations are for actually uh, lowering that stake over time. It, you can't do it right away, correct? So uh, let me just go back to the beginning of the Baker Hughes transaction. So we had an upstream uh, oil equipment business that we merged with their service business, created a much broader platform, a stronger asset. But part of the original thought process of that transaction was it does create optionality for us going forward. So this is not new news in that sense. It was embedded in the original right. transaction, first point. Second point, we closed in July of 2017. There's a two-year, essentially, window where the directors of the, uh, the Baker Hughes directors who are on the BHGE board have essentially a consent uh, discussion to have if we want to do something different with our holdings. That's the, the technical thing. And the third, we're exploring it. I said yesterday, we've established a new committee on our board, uh, a finance and capital allocation committee. And the first thing I've asked them to work on is evaluate what the options and what the forms of exit might be for the Baker Hughes uh, asset. And we'll come back when we've determined that. Um, on Alsom, uh, you were intimately involved in the purchase Correct. of that asset. Uh, any regrets there? Do you feel as though that was well purchased at the time? Um, given some of the headwinds you're seeing? So I'd say that deal in, in total has been a disappointment. So I'd start with that. We bought the Alstom asset really for three basic strategic reasons. One was the installed base, a very large installed base. That's the cornerstone of our business model and in multiple industries that we're in. Long-term asset, productivity, the chance to replace sockets as they age over time. So that was the first one. Second was a broader product line. They made things, uh, you know, in steam and generators and things that we don't do that we could sell with our gas turbines. And then lastly, a significant amount of cost synergies. Uh, so we started out with a target of $1.3 billion for its cost synergies. We've upped that to $3 billion. Those things largely have played out. What has not played out and, and has really uh, overtaken those things, the market clearly has been substantially worse than what we forecast. The company went through a very extended closing process, antitrust review, et cetera. I've been uh, running healthcare for a year by the time that closed. That was a, a, a tough period for the company in terms of orders and down payments and things. And then lastly, some of the projects, as we talked last time, we've had some losses there. So it's, we were looking at a high teens return. I'd say we're in single digit return. It's not a, a acceptable deal from a financial framework right now. But the last thing I'd say is these are 20, 30, 40 year assets. And our task is to keep working these incredibly hard. But if we could go back in a time machine today, we would pay a substantially lower price than we paid. There's no doubt about that. Let's go over, John, the, uh, the asset sales. I'm uh, going to rely on Mr. Tusa's research because he turned out to be right. $17 was his prediction when it was a 30. He said, how much cash and earnings will you be losing with the asset sales? Because that's important because these businesses do generate a return. Yeah. So there's a whole mix in here, Jim, of assets that we ha have identified in a $20 billion pool. And we have a slightly larger pool than that. So there's a final determination of what gets uh, included in that. But I, I would say, in general, these are much smaller assets, with the exception maybe of transportation. These are smaller assets. Many of them have uh, very small cash flows. Some have negative cash flows. So I expect the package of that whole transaction as we complete it to basically be accretive to the overall economics and cash flow of the company. In other words, the, the proceeds are going to be in excess of the multiple, if you will. So what, what's the best use of those proceeds? Listen, there's a wide range of things to look at. Is a fluid uh, process. So we outlined yesterday our uh, total shareholder return approach, a dividend, uh, share buyback where it makes sense, M&A where it makes sense, organic investment where it makes sense, uh, funding our pension where it makes sense. We had an announcement about debt funding that. So I'm going to see the outcomes first of what the proceeds are and what we, we have before us. But I think the, you know, again, we talk about capital allocation. It happens inside the business day in, day out. That's what I'm heavily focused on. And then as we have proceeds from disposition, we'll, we'll see. It depends on what, for example, our share price is or what other alternatives we have. So I look at the deployment of capital in a highly analytical, clinical way around risk-adjusted return for the money that we have. And that could be a range of things. I know you want uh, some new board members. Can you describe to us what those three new board members' qualifications will be? 
and whether they will uh, share an orientation, perhaps, of Mr. Gordon from Tryon, which is to be kind of an insurgent inside, to, to really push to make sure that the capital allocation is right and the, uh, let's just say, the culture, as you talk about in this round. So a couple things on that, Jim. I think we detailed yesterday we're looking for industry expertise in these three new directors. So in, uh, in power, in aviation, healthcare, some combination of that and more digital and technology orientation going forward. With respect to the, the, the push and the debate and everything, I totally welcome that. I, I, I want board members, and we have board members that push back. That's, I'm more than comfortable with that. I think that's a healthy dynamic. Uh, Ed Garden is, uh, joined us last month. I expect that from him. I expect it from everybody, including the new board members. You mentioned the dividend cut. Uh, was there a camp inside the board that uh, wanted to not cut it? And Jeff, Emeld always said that cutting back in the day was yeah. one of the worst days of his career. I wonder if you think you'll say the same eventually. Listen, we said before, we went through just an analytical exercise. So there's a whole, the construct of how we had a 96 cent dividend is tied to the whole evolution of selling GE Capital, what we expected to grow, the industrial earnings. That turned out not to unfold the way we had underwritten at the time. And so we had a very uh, balanced analytical discussion around the dividend relative to our free cash flow and the prospects for our free cash flow. And we came to a determination collectively, uh, very solidly, uh, that it was too high a dividend to sustain going forward. And it was in the best interest of the shareholders in the company to reduce that to a level that's in line with our peers in terms of payout ratio, in line with uh, uh, our peers in terms of dividend yield. With respect to the comments about the worst day ever, I don't underestimate in any sense, and I feel this deeply, the gravity of what we have had to do and the, the people that rely on that dividend, especially the people who are relying on this for current income, this is a, this is a very, very tough measure. And so it's not anything we took lightly. I looked at this in very great detail, and I just felt in the end it was something we had to do. So it's, it's not something that's easy to go through, and I'm fully cognizant of the shareholder impact on that. And are you thinking at all at this point about a path to restoring the dividend, even if it's not to where it once was? Listen, I come back to the, the, the most important thing for us to do now is improve the results of the company, improve the cash flow of the company, be incredibly disciplined about how we invest the capital of the company to the end of growing the earnings in cash. And as we grow the earnings in cash, job one, we'll move the dividend forward too. So we, it all comes back to, I think, this whole discussion. How are we running the company? How are we allocating the capital? How's the operating rigor? And that's really what we have to focus. Um, as we look at the stock price of $18.59, uh, you're going to have a larger portion of equity comprise overall compensation, I believe, or at least in For some senior of, leaders of the company. Senior leaders. Right. But what about morale overall? Uh, you know, sometimes it can be a reflection of a stock price. You're talking about one that's down 41% for the course of this year, John. Is morale uh, a concern for you at the company? I mean, of, of course it is, but it's also a, a challenge and an opportunity in a leader, leadership sense. So a couple of things I'd say on that. One is I'm not trying to run the company for the reaction on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. We have a long-term plan. We have a lot of work to do. We have incredibly great franchises that we're focused on, and I'm confident in the future of the company. So I think for personally, it, getting equity compensation at this point in the cycle is something I expect to be a, a positive as we move forward. The other thing I'd say on the morale and culture of the company, this is a company that has incredible passion from employees, incredible pride. And you can, you can debate certain parts of our culture. You can never debate that one. And people want to change. They want to move forward. There's a, my task is to stoke it, the competitive spirit in the company. And so it's a, it's a challenge. No one likes to see this. No one, no one likes to look at their stock price and go down and say, I, f I feel good about that. That's obvious, goes without saying. But it, there's a lot of pent up energy and desire for, you know, redemption and improvement. And so my job is to channel that as a leader. And obviously people look at how I feel about the right. prospects ahead. And I 
recognize the heavy lift, but I feel great and about you think the prospects. You can continue to attract uh, quality people as sure. well. I mean, I can remember an ad campaign not that long ago. Of course, GE is a technology company. Right. Yep. Uh, the young Still people are. who right who uh, can you get that kind of a person to come come work at GE given the the difficulties Listen, the, the, the company's company's, David, for? the company's been around for 125 years. We've reinvented ourselves many, many, many times. We're in that process again. We've constantly leverage our technology to reinvent and move the company in different directions. So people who want a, you know, exciting new direction, I'll, I'll recruit anybody and talk to anybody, but people are going to have to want the battle, want to change, want to move the company forward. People want an easy task and, uh, you know, I don't want too much challenge. That's, that's not for us and that's not for them. Massive heavy lifting. I keep hearing that. Why would I own a stock? My travel trust does own it. Why would I, I want to own a stock if I know that 2018 is a year of massive heavy lifting? Look at the track. Again, I go back to, first of all, it depends on your time horizon, so I don't need to uh, I won't tell you sure. about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. time. But time horizon is, is not made up by 30 down to 17. No, I understand. I'm, you're, you're asking right now yes, why I would someone yes. buy the shares exactly. right now. I would say the outlook for the company over three to five years, what we laid it for over three to five years, growing cash and earnings over three to five years, that's what someone should buy. So it's, is it going to be immediate? Is it going to happen in two months, four months, six months? No, there's operational things we need to change to the company. But if you're investing for a, a, you know, a, a balanced return, a dividend and capital gain over you know, a, a, an extended time period, I keep coming back to Jim. The other thing, keep coming back to the power of the franchises and the power of the company. And the, you know, again, we have a big issue in our power business. Other assets in the company are very strong. You look at our aviation business, I'd stack that up against any business you know, on the planet. You look at our healthcare business with the growth, global growth in that, the power of our life science business in that. We've got a whole other cell therapy business in that. So I know the headline is the macro picture and it must be, but there's something under the hood that is worth considering as well. Uh, well, John, we certainly appreciate your willingness to come on, spend time with us. No, it's good. And we look forward to future conversations as well as we monitor the progress you've been talking about. So Great. thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. John Flannery, see you again. Much. Chairman Thanks. and CEO of uh, GE. When we come back, more reaction to this morning's retail 